Hello, I'm Serena Giusti. I'm teaching comparative politics at the University of Padova. And today we will spend some time together talking about the European policy towards uh, the eastern part of Europe, but also doing some uh, reflection about the post enlargement strategy of the European Union. As you know, the European Union has changed over time. It has changed in terms of uh, policies, in terms of institution, decision-making process, and in terms of membership as well. Uh, the EU began with six members, uh, it grew to 15 in the 90s, and uh, it um, included further 12 uh, member states between 2004 and 2007. And as you know, uh, Croatia uh, joined this year uh, the European Union. Every enlargement has been uh, uh, anticipated by a phase of uh, uh, deepening. So the dialectic between deepening and widening has always uh, characterized the history of the European Union. But here I would like to stress how much uh, new members have impacted uh, the geopolitical um, concern of uh, the European Union. As you can see from uh, the maps, uh, every time there has been an enlargement, there has been a new uh, orientation in the policies of the European Union, a, ge a new geopolitical uh, orientation. Um, here you have uh, Europe in 1958 with just six members. Then you have in 1973 the first uh, northern enlargement which opened the European Union to uh, northern uh, interests as well. Then we have in 1981 uh, the inclusion of Greece. As you can see from uh, the map, the inclusion of Greece uh, created a sort of geographical discontinuity uh, because uh, the Balkan uh, at that time was a, a former was Yugoslavia uh, was not part of the territory of uh, the Union. Then we have the second uh, southern enlargement in 1986 uh, to include both Portugal and Spain. And then in 1991, uh, we have German unification. Uh, German unification is not considered a traditional enlargement because there was no agreement on that. But nevertheless, uh, the fact that the eastern part of Germany entered the European Union creates new uh, equilibrium in the European Union. The European Union was obliged to look more eastwards and many countries of the European Union were concerned about the weight of uh, Germany. Uh, with the second northern enlargement in 1995 to include uh, Finland, uh, Sweden and Austria, uh, the uh, focus of the European Union was further moved uh, to the east because uh, through Finland uh, the European Union got close uh, to uh, Russia as well. And then we arrived in 2004 uh, with the so-called big enlargement uh, to include many of uh, the uh, former satellite of uh, Russia and also some former republic, as in the case of Lithuania, Estonia and Latvia. Uh, Poland entered the European Union, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia and, uh, um, and also uh, Slovenia. Uh, that was part of uh, uh, the former uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, and also uh, we have two islands, Malta and uh, the Greek part of Cyprus, which entered the European Union. Uh, this eastern enlargement was uh, completed by the accession of Romania and Bulgaria in 2007. With the accession of these two countries, uh, we had uh, the uh, restoring of the continuation, the territorial continuation of the European Union, and Greece was uh, finally connected to the rest of uh, the uh, European Union. Uh, then, as uh, I was saying before, uh, we have in 2013, so this year, uh, the accession of uh, Croatia. Now, uh, what about future enlargement? As you may know, uh, the uh, enlargement of the European Union is regulated by the so-called Copenhagen criteria. Uh, 
Uh, the Copenhagen criteria was set in 1993, uh, especially to uh, phase up uh, the big enlargement. In fact, as we mentioned before, there were two waves of enlargement, uh, 2004 and then 2007. Uh, what are about this uh, Copenhagen criteria? Um, there are uh, political uh, criteria in the sense that the Union is asking to a new country uh, to fulfill um, the principle of uh, democracy, uh, the respect of uh, human rights and especially the respect of minority. Minority was a very salient issue uh, at the end of the Cold War because there were uh, minority dispersed in uh, different countries and there was also uh, the fear that some country want to uh, enlarge their territory to include uh, this minority. Uh, one case is, for instance, Hungary. But also the question of minority was uh, relevant in the accession of uh, the Baltic states because there, there were uh, many uh, Russian uh, citizens which were start to be uh, discriminated. Uh, another important criteria is the economic one. Uh, new members are required to have a, a market economy and to be able to compete with the forces of the common market within uh, the European Union. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to judge if uh, these countries are able or not to compete with these forces, uh, but this is, of course, um, a way for the European Union to uh, have a last say in the session of some country. And finally, we have the um, criteria of the uh, capacity uh, to adapt to the so-called acquis communitaire. This means that all the new members uh, need to absorb uh, whatever has been achieved within uh, the European Union. This means that they have to adopt the treaties on which the European Union has been based, uh, to um, adopt the old legislation, uh, to comply with the judgment of the uh, European Court of Justice, and also to share the same objective of uh, the uh, current member states, in the sense that uh, all the uh, new targets uh, of the European Union have to be accepted by new members. That means, for instance, the new members have to adopt the European Monetary Union and they do not have any uh, chance of opting out from that. Uh, in 2005, the European Union tried to review this accession strategy and make it, it, it even uh, more difficult. Uh, it was uh, established that before any further enlargement, uh, the European Union should be uh, consolidated, the conditionality should be uh, stricter than in the past, and that means that, for instance, in the negotiation um, for the accession, uh, before opening a new chapter, the previous one has to be concluded and signed. Uh, while before it was possible to open many chapters uh, at the same time. Now this is not possible anymore. You open a chapter, you negotiate on that, you conclude then and then again you can start with a new one. Uh, the European Commission also said that it was very much important uh, to work on communication in both the European Union and in the candidate country because they realized that the enlargement was not communicated in the right way, that uh, within the European Union there were many uh, fear, and also for the candidate, uh, the benefits of joining the Union was, were not so clear as at the beginning of the uh, process of acceding to uh, the uh, European Union. So, we have discussed uh, the criteria to accede uh, the European Union. Uh, what's next? Uh, as you know, um, in uh, 2003, in the occasion of the Thessaloniki European Council, uh, the European Union decided formally to give the chance uh, for membership to the Balkan states. Now, uh, this process will much depend especially on uh, the relation between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, Turkey 
start uh, the uh, negotiation for a session already in 2005 while Iceland start in 2010. These two countries will be probably uh, the next member of the European Union. We have to say, in any case, that the accession of Turkey is particularly difficult and that uh, these uh, negotiations are taking a lot of time. Uh, why? Because uh, in the European Union the uh, climate is not so favorable uh, to the accession of Turkey and within Turkey as well uh, the attraction to the European Union is not as high as it was before. Uh, Turkey is, uh, has been a very assertive uh, foreign policy, uh, economically is doing well and it seems it has less need for Europe than uh, before. So it will be very interesting to see how this process will continue. I just want to uh, call your attention on the fact that uh, because of uh, uh, the uh, enlargement, uh, the uh, pan-European space is a sort of, say, very fragmented. We have the old member states, uh, we have the new member states, some of them are not yet part of the European Monetary Union. Uh, in the past, they uh, had transitional period, so, for instance, they uh, could not immediately benefit uh, from the uh, freedom of movement of people. So, it's like they were uh, characterized by sort of uh, differentiated integration. Then, as we have said, we had uh, some countries which are actually negotiating a session, uh, Turkey and Iceland. Then we have candidate country, the Balkan, so country uh, for whom there is uh, the possibility of a session. And then we have uh, a group, uh, a very big group of outsider. But even within outsider, we can identify different groups. Uh, they are the Eastern uh, European country which theoretically, in principle, could become member of the European Union because according to Article 49, they are European, they are based in Europe. Uh, they are uh, the Caucasus country, Azerbaijan, Armenia and Georgia, for which this membership is not feasible, at least at the moment. And then we have the Northern Mediterranean country, uh, which are excluded from uh, the membership because if we uh, follow the principle of geography, we know that they are based in Africa and they're not European. But I can also say that this principle of geography uh, may change over time and it could be uh, more politicized. So that means that probably in the long term, even this country might become member if uh, the criteria will be more political and more economic rather than geographical. But this is a, it's really the long, uh, long time future. Um, as uh, for the present, uh, we can say that uh, as uh, the big enlargement 2004 and 2005 uh, was, um, uh, was um, uh, taking place, already uh, the debate about what about the outsider was already uh, very lively. And actually, uh, this debate was um, spur, was uh, moved uh, by uh, the uh, academics. Uh, they were uh, talking about uh, the possibility of new uh, divide line uh, within Europe. And uh, uh, they were trying to suggest ways to politicians how to avoid them. Uh, was, um, it was um, uh, president of the commission, Romano Prodi, that for the first time talked about the uh, possibility uh, of um, a strategy of inclusion for those um, countries uh, which were outside the enlarged European Union. And uh, for the first time, he asserted the principle of uh, uh, everything but the institution, which became the cornerstone of European neighbor uh, policy. What he meant by this principle, everything but the institution. He meant that this country should be uh, involved as much as possible 
in the policies of the European Union without, however, uh, giving them for the time being the possibility of becoming members. So uh, this strategy was based on a progressive convergence of the European Union uh, without any way letting this country to take place in the decision-making process of uh, the European Union. So the objective of this new policy, uh, the European Neighbour Policy, were the, uh, creating the creation of a ring of friends uh, around uh, the European Union, uh, we should share uh, some principle and, uh, with the European Union and value of uh, the European Union. Now, if you look at the map, you can see that in uh, green, uh, there are uh, those countries uh, to which the European neighbor policy is uh, directed. Uh, Russia was initially uh, included, but then Russia uh, decided to stay outside this policy uh, because Russia wants to be treated as an equal with the European Union, so prefer uh, not to be part of the strategy, but to have bilateral relations with the European Union. Uh, so the European neighbor policy is composed by three groups. We have the eastern neighbors, uh, which include Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova. Then you have the southern neighbors, a big group that include Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Israel, Lebanon, Libya, uh, Morocco, Palestine, Syria, uh, Tunisia. Uh, and then we have the Southern Caucasus country uh, with Georgia, um, Azerbaijan and uh, uh, Armenia. Uh, as you can know, this is a very dishomogeneous uh, group. Uh, these um, countries are characterized by different uh, problematic. Anyway, the decision of the Union was to uh, offer a comprehensive strategy but within this strategy, each of these countries would have had a strong bilateral relation uh, with the European Union. And any progress on this relationship uh, should have been based on uh, the capacity and the will of the partner country to advance in integration uh, with the European Union. So the European neighbor policy is characterized by a differentiated approach even if uh, within a common uh, framework. What are uh, the objectives of the European neighbor policy? Uh, the objectives are uh, to uh, promote reforms in this country and to open this country uh, to the common market with the European Union. Um, the uh, advancement of this policy was very much, as I said, based on uh, uh, different countries' uh, progress. So this policy at the end was very much differentiated. We can say that there were countries uh, which did not participate, as uh, the case of Libya, or which participate very marginally, as the case of Belarus. Uh, which of course refuse uh, to um, subscribe the principle of conditionality entailed by uh, this, uh, uh, this policy. Um, at a certain point, um, this policy was uh, divided, was divorced, uh, and it was decided to uh, strengthen uh, first the Mediterranean dimension, and this happened in 2008 under uh, the uh, French presidency had by uh, President uh, Sarkozy, who wanted to uh, reinforce uh, the Mediterranean policy of uh, the European Union. And so um, it was created the uh, European Union for uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, this uh, uh, new dimension uh, was a sort of um, uh, framework uh, to uh, especially promote big investment in infrastructure. But as we can say now, uh, a posteriori, um, that was not a framework uh, which uh, uh, work as um, uh, promoting democracy or as uh, promoting deep reform as the uh, Arab Spring showed 
uh, just few uh, years later. Um, a year after, uh, there was a decision based on a proposal by uh, Poland and Sweden to even reinforce the eastern uh, dimension of the European neighbor policy. Uh, it's quite interesting that uh, two countries like Poland and Sweden decide to uh, promote this policy. That means that within the European Union there is a, a great competition uh, on uh, uh, the uh, uh, foreign policy, on uh, uh, deciding which uh, country should be a uh, favorite, uh, which country should be uh, help more in advancing in integration with the European Union. So, uh, as you can see from the, from the map, uh, the uh, country included in the Eastern Partnership are uh, Ukraine, uh, Belarus, Moldova, and then in uh, uh, the South Caucasus, uh, Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan and uh, Georgia. Uh, what are the differences between the uh, European neighbor policy and the Eastern Partnership? Uh, the Eastern Partnership, um, in the Eastern Partnership, the European Union has enriched its offer because the European Union is able and willing to offer association agreement uh, with the uh, Eastern Partner, which include a deep and comprehensive free trade area. Uh, that means that in the long term this country could take part in the uh, common market of uh, the European Union. So the idea is to create a, a big market between the European Union member states and the Eastern Partner. And also another important uh, aim of the Eastern Partnership is to guarantee a full visa liberalization uh, with this country. Uh, I will call your attention on the fact that so far uh, the European Union and the Eastern Partnership were not even able uh, to agree on the facilitation of visa. So uh, liberalization of visa uh, will be really a long-term uh, objective. Um, again, even the Eastern Partnership is based on bilateral relations, so progress uh, will uh, follow the path of reforming in the, in the Eastern uh, Partner. Just to stress the fact that Belarus is not uh, concretely taking part uh, in this uh, uh, Eastern dimension uh, for obvious uh, uh, political reason. Uh, Belarus is still considered the, the latest dictatorship in uh, Europe. Uh, the president Lukashenko uh, does not want to uh, uh, fulfill uh, all the benchmark set up by the European Union. The result is that uh, there are no official relations, the European Union is just supporting some uh, specific program devoted to the uh, Chernobyl uh, effects. But besides that, uh, the European Union is trying to uh, influence uh, the evolution of the country, but without uh, any uh, real uh, success for the moment. Um, this is an occasion also uh, to say that this is a very competitive region in the sense there are many other actors which have an interest in this area located between the larger Union and the, let's say, resurgent Russia. Uh, um, China. Uh, for instance, is very active. Uh, China is investing a lot in this uh, country. Uh, at the moment, uh, China is doing so for diversify its uh, uh, clients' portfolio uh, for having uh, also uh, different uh, investment in different uh, geographical areas, but also in different uh, sectors of uh, the economy. Um, China is very much interested in the energy sector, uh, not only oil and gas, but also alternative resource in this uh, country. Uh, for the moment, uh, Russia is not very much preoccupied uh, with uh, China investing uh, there, also because China is investing uh, in countries like Belarus. Uh, that is a, a dictatorship and uh, uh, the Chinese investment 
can help the reinforcement of that uh, dictatorship, which is su supported by Russia as well. So, so far, let's say that Russian and China uh, interests are not colliding. Uh, it's not yet clear if uh, this situation will stay, uh, but we can say that uh, for the moment China has just economic interests there. Uh, Turkey already is another uh, active actor, but uh, I would say that the most um, important and relevant actor in the area is Russia. Uh, Russia is a sort of competitive power uh, with the European Union. Uh, this is the reason why Russia was uh, very uh, much against uh, and critical about the Eastern Partnership because Russia considered it as a way for the European Union to exert an influence in its traditional area of influence. And uh, um, Lavrov has said that uh, Lavrov is the uh, foreign minister of the Russian Federation has said that the Eastern Partnership is not a neutral uh, policy, but it is a, a sort of aggressive policy by uh, the European Union. Uh, this kind of competition between the European Union and Russia is not helping uh, the stabilization of uh, this area. On the contrary, is causing uh, some oscillation in domestic polity and the case in point is certain Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has a very pragmatic policy. It's look at the European Union as far as the European Union is guaranteeing some economic benefit but it's also looking at Russia because Russia is its uh, energy uh, provider and through energy Russia is able to have a strong leverage on domestic politics of Ukraine. What could be uh, the solution? Uh, difficult to say. Uh, what we can uh, uh, support is the idea of uh, a more fruitful dialogue uh, between the European Union and Russia. Uh, we believe that just uh, with a, a more uh, relaxed relation between the Union and Russia, it could be possible uh, to find a solution uh, for this uh, still unstable in-between uh, area. Uh, I would say that probably we should start to think about the uh, idea uh, proposed by uh, President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, to have a sort of big uh, market, pan-European big market. So even if we can think that uh, uh, Putin uh, was um, was a sort of um, doing a provocation. Uh, I think that we should think about this idea of uh, having a pan-European uh, market. So uh, the idea of starting a deeper cooperation uh, with the uh, Eastern country and with Russia as well, starting from uh, the economics. So it's just. Uh, uh, to apply a sort of neo-functionalist uh, approach, the one that worked uh, within the European Union, also to the outsider of uh, the European Union as well. So, uh, as you have understood by now, uh, this is a very competitive uh, area, and for the Union it's very difficult to shape an effective uh, strategy there. Now, just a few questions to think about. Uh, how the economic crisis is affecting uh, the European Union offer? The European Union certainly has less instrument than uh, it had before, while Russia, even if it if is growing less economically than in the past, still is growing and still has instrument to influence politics uh, there. And uh, what do you think about uh, a better cooperation, a deeper cooperation about the European Union and Russia? On which uh, issue, question should it be based? Uh, what are the common uh, value, common uh, uh, objective, common policies that these two uh, relevant actors in the pan-European space can, uh, uh, can share, can work uh, together? 
all this is open uh, to debate and um, when you uh, start to think the possibility uh, for the European Union, uh, please remember uh, the, the factor that are at the base of the decision of the Union. So uh, the differentiation within the European Union, uh, the different position of European member states regarding foreign policy, we have already stressed that, and the fact that we uh, lack resource, economic and financial resource to be effective in the area.